Father, we ask for your assistance as we study your word. Grant us your spirit that we might take in the vital points you want to communicate to us and be affected in both thought and action as you desire. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue in John as Jesus reveals himself to his disciples in the upper room in this farewell discourse. And one of the things he had to do was to prepare the 11 true disciples for the shock of Judas's betrayal. It's a difficult subject, but we must cover it as part of the whole counsel of God over the course of time. So in this passage, we'll be dealing with firstly a warning against betrayal, verse 18 to 21. Second, reclining next to Jesus, 22 to 25. And thirdly, coping with treachery, uh, verse 26 to 30. So firstly, Jesus warns them about his betrayal in verse 18 to 21. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. So this may be the most pointed, yet it's one of many warnings Jesus made about his betrayer. In John 6, 70 to 71, uh, Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He was speaking about Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. For although Judas was one of the twelve, he was later to betray Jesus. He's told his disciples that they're not all clean, in verse 10 and 11, despite washing their feet. And what he is only addressing to the clean ones is the previous statement in verse 17 that they'll be blessed if they do that is put into practice what they've learned from him for one of them though verse 18 there was no point saying this he was already lost the son of perdition now that is not something that we can apply to the lost around us today who for all we know might yet be saved but Jesus knew of a certainty those he had chosen and those he had not based on whom the father had given him for a heritage. Judas had previously been chosen, 6 verse 70, yet as a disciple, but not, it seems, as an apostle or even someone to be saved. Not all election is to salvation. The betrayal had to happen so that redemption could come to all men at all. But Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, if that's what it was, the sin that is not forgiven, remains just that. At the same time, scripture must be fulfilled. We read in Psalm 41, 9, even my trusted friend who ate my bread has raised his heel against me. King David suffered many betrayals from men around him. He had shared his bread with them, but they had lifted up their heels against him, breaking what was the sanctity of hospitality and courtesy in ancient Near Eastern culture. If, if you looked after someone from a position of authority or power, uh, they were in your debt and you, you jolly well expected loyalty. And if you didn't get it, you, you had the right to pretty much knock them off. That's not the way God wants us to live, but it's the way the Middle East has always worked. Such is fallen, largely heathen culture. But you, know, you can see why there won't be peace there until Jesus returns. So Psalm 41 is, is not messianic as a whole but that one verse clearly is and many other features of David's life clearly pointed forward to Christ not least in 2 Samuel 7 16 and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you your throne shall be established forever you know, David was just a man albeit a great one but some of the language used to describe him only makes sense in the light of his greater son um, Psalm 16, 9 to 10, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. 
My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in shale, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And Christ was about to display his, his glory above all in his betrayal, his sufferings, humiliation and death. And that is how it's possible for us to be redeemed. But Jesus even had his own betrayal firmly in hand. Verse 19. His concern is rather for the 11 disciples who are about to be scattered and sorely tested by the events of the next few hours. He leaves these predictions with them, he says, so that when they come to pass, as they surely would, they may see that he is, that he is, literally I am, the Christ, not just in terms of a great prophet, but as God himself. Isaiah 41, 4, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. His disciples must keep faith and keep together during this difficult time, ready for the events of the resurrection, ascension and Pentecost, when they will be vindicated by the Holy Spirit and reap a great harvest of souls. But Jesus goes on, verse 20, following on from this I am statement, and this is to do with his relationship to the Father. He is God the Son, with all the implications coming from the fact. Uh, John 5, 23, that all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father, which hath sent him. So for the disciples, their loyalty to the Son is the measure of, of their standing with the Father. Betrayal of him must be fatal, even though for, for denials like Peter's, there would be a way back in true repentance. But as apostles, when commissioned, when recommissioned, they will be his representatives to a needy world that many more might accept Christ and so be right with the Father. And it goes further than that for his people. So receive Christ's servants, and you receive him. In Matthew 10, 40, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And the apostles would find when they went out, they would find that the people they witnessed to would either warm to them and receive Christ or reject both. And we often still find that today. But the father who sent Jesus accepts all who trust in him. Jesus has faithfully passed on all that his father gave him to do and to say and it is for us to believe and so be accepted by God and now we come to the most explicit statement of Jesus about his betrayal verse 21 and it was it was difficult for those disciples to take it in just like his his predictions like um, that the father the Christ had to suffer could this really be but if it could well, these words are being said by a man who's never wrong in what he says. We've got to take it at his word. So they might have been wondering, what is this betrayal to look like? What, what, does he mean a deliberate betrayal or an accidental one? Could it even affect such a person who, who can still the storm and cast out demons? Could he really allow himself to suffer? Is that realistic? Of course, Jesus, knowing far more than them, was already suffering in his spirit about what was going to happen to him. And this is what he was testifying to them about, already knowing who it was from verse 2. Jesus certainly had a human spirit, but we must also acknowledge the fact that in his two natures he is fully human and yet fully divine. As a man, Jesus no doubt was troubled when he sensed this treacherous heart in Judas. And we may have had a similar experience with someone. These things affect us. It affects us too when, when most of the world positions itself as Christ's enemy. But we're also told that the, the spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9. Now you are not in flesh, but in spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not of him. The knowledge of future betrayal or the insight into the heart of Judas grieved Jesus. Sin betrays Christ. It grieves the Holy Spirit. 
Now, that is supposed to help us to stop sinning. I know it won't altogether, but it might help us win a few battles here and there. Always keep that in mind. Our sin grieves our Lord and Saviour who has bought us with his own blood. Well, secondly, this idea of reclining next to Jesus, verse 22 to 25. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? So after that warning of betrayal, the Lord's disciples stared at one another. Verse 22, at a loss to know which of them he meant. Mark tells us in 1419, they were distressed. And one by one, they said to him, surely not I. It was startling for them to suddenly realize it must be one of them. One of the inner circle, there was no one else there. And it might have been said, uh, surely not I, rather insincerely by Judas, who by now could see that the game was nearly up. He must either confess all and repent, or immediately go into action. And then there's John, who introduces himself to us humbly and gratefully as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Verse 23, he loved them all, of course, verse 1. But this is, if you like, John's pseudonym. He's a bit shy of using his proper name. And he was in a close friendship with Jesus, enough so to be reclining next to him, probably to his right. And this closeness comes out frequently in, in his gospel, his letters, even in Revelation. It's, it's a picture of that relationship of love that we need to be in with Jesus Christ. And what it also shows is that Jesus, as fully man, valued human relationships, friendships. We've noted this already with uh, Lazarus and his sisters in uh, chapter 11, verse 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And he wants to be friends with you too. In John 15, 13 to 15. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. And for that, we don't need his physical breast to lean on. We apprehend him by faith. We seek to be near him in spirit and in truth. Now, Reclining against each other was not the traditional way of eating the Passover meal. In Exodus 12, 11, we see, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now this command through Moses had long been abandoned, even by this group, in favour of the more intimate, more relaxed way that came in as Human society developed and standards of living improved. Um, at first, it had been adopted only by the decadent and degenerate. It was spotted by Amos um, in Amos 6, 4 and 6. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory. You lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. Uh, verse 6, you drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. But by the first century, it was understood that actually there was nothing wrong with physically reclining. It was no bad thing for ordinary believers to share the meal in this more comfortable and tactile manner. The new tradition gradually took over, not just for the wicked, but for the sincere too. It would be a low table without seating and they reclined leaning on each other's bodies for comfort. Not with their sandals on their feet, they just had their feet washed. And John was in a close enough position to lean directly on Jesus' breast and so catch every word he said. So we must ignore da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper with some seated separately and some standing nicely socially distanced. 
Middle Eastern culture among men was at that time and remains now far more touchy-feely uh, than we would venture to be in the West. Well, that aside, what happened next? Simon Peter, who must have been leaning on the other side of John, gestured to him and then was the first to break the silence, verse 24. Uh, but even he, uh, rather than voice his concerns publicly, asked him very privately, perhaps in a whisper, uh, which of them uh, Jesus meant and how the others didn't know what was going on. We don't know. They may have been distracted or couldn't make it out. Now, John evidently had his back to Jesus against him, verse 25. So the, the easiest way to have a quiet word with him was to lean further back um, <clears throat> against his breast, so to speak, to pass on Peter's inquiry who the traitor was. Um, but all this positioning, this is how close we too want to get to Jesus in order to be close to the heart of God. Do we enjoy that intimacy with him whereby we take him into our complete confidence and ourselves into his? Thirdly, coping with treachery, verse 26 to 30. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. So Jesus had received the question from John and he gave his answer, verse 26, but again, quietly, privately, he explained to John the code by which he would reveal the traitor. He would get a sop, that's a piece of bread, ideally shaped for dunking, dip it in the dish and give it to the one with evil intentions. So he dipped the sop and he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So John and maybe Peter too had been informed in this chosen coded way <coughs> as the two, the two apostles who seemed to be closest to Jesus and the significance of the sop may be manifold. Um, the way the Lord gave it was, in fact, a demonstration of kindness and honor. To choose a nice bit of food and give it to someone, Jesus loved his enemies. How good are we at that? There was no censure for Judas, no, no rebuke. If anything, he's singled out from the others for special favor in the social context. And one commentator says that early on in the Passover meal, traditionally, there would be a bowl of fruit salad made from dates, raisins, maybe almonds, and sour wine, which they called caroset. I think they still use it. Those who know, Catherine's nodding, good. And into this, bread with bitter herbs might be dipped, possibly grasping some fruit pieces and bringing out a tasty morsel. Uh, Matthew 26, 23, and he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. And Judas may have been immediately to the left hand of Jesus, uh, consciously placed in that position of honor, high honor, to receive it from him. But that's the position of honor that he would betray. Because when we consider the bread and the wine in which it was dipped, don't we think of the warning uh, about communion in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 27 to 29, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So it seems that in some way, this was applicable to Judas here. He takes the sop, as it were, the communion, the last supper, but he's in no fit state really to do so. 
Some have called it a satanic sacrament, a sign of judgment from the fact that as soon as Judas took the bread, verse 27, Satan entered into him. Yet it seems to have been given to him so gently and lovingly that it was on Judas's own conscience to rebel against such love and privilege. But he could not be won back. He chose Satan and treachery. He was appointed to do so, and Satan had no difficulty entering him. He became possessed in some way by the devil or was afflicted with temptations, the thought of gain, disillusionment with Christ. Is he really the Messiah? Then why are his people so few, so powerless? That's no good for me. There are far better opportunities if I go back to Pharisaism or zealotry. I'll certainly see more action that way. So whatever was on his heart, the Lord knew it. Nothing passes him. As a divine person, he shares God's omniscience. And Jesus, knowing all things, knowingly said to Judas, what you are about to do, do quickly. Implying more quickly than you had in mind. This at least was said clearly enough for everyone there to hear this time, but they didn't understand why it was said to him, verse 28, even though John, at least, had effectively been told, he doesn't seem to associate it with that yet. And so it was God's will at that time that they didn't understand those words, even Peter and John still giving Judas the benefit of the doubt. Instead, they supposed that he had been asked to buy what was needed for the feast, verse 29, or to give something to the poor. After all, he had charge of the money, a position of great trust. Jesus obviously still trusted him with that. And as for the disciples, they may not have realized yet that he was a thief as well as a traitor. John 12, 6, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Now, on the Passover night, trading was restricted, but not entirely banned. And it might be important to get things in before the day of preparation. Only it was already after sunset. On a high Sabbath, not a Saturday, you couldn't use cash, only a pledge or trust. But why would he need to buy a young lamb when the Lamb of God was sitting there right with him? Giving to the poor was a bit more likely, as they would gather at the temple gates from midnight when they were opened for the Passover, and they would sit there begging for alms, so maybe. But the poor would always be with them. Whereas before them, there in the room was he who was rich beyond all measure, but for who, for love's sake, would become the poorest in the universe for a time the very next day. Well, Judas must have been left in no doubt that Jesus knew all about his heart and his plans. And as for Jesus, consider the perfection of the man. He's about to be betrayed to death. He doesn't protest doesn't rant and rave, doesn't run away. He just quietly accepts what is his father's will for the future. And he even loves his betrayer to the end. What can we learn from this about our proper response to suffering, to deadly suffering, to hatred, to oppos opposition? It's not bitterness. It's not disillusionment. It's to nobly love our enemies and do what good we can to those who seek to harm us. Of course, we know that Judas's real reason for going out was treasonable, uh, verse 30. But note that even though he was a rebel and a traitor, he was still compelled to obey any direct command from Jesus. He'd been told to do what he must quickly. And so after that last mouthful, he, he went out straight away into the night. And so again, we have confirmed how fully in control Jesus is, even in that situation. We repeat in John 10, 17 to 18, the reason the Father loves me is that I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. So Judas went out into the night Passover takes place on a full moon, so the night will be less dark than usual, except in the heart of Judas. Matthew 25, 30, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
the Bible associates night very often with darkness and wickedness. The sun had gone down, darkness reigned. John 9, 4, we must not work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So Judas would go finally to his own place. And meanwhile, Jesus, although he was calm and collected outwardly, he must have been suffering deep grief within. Luke twenty two fifty three, 53, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour, the power of darkness. Judas would betray him for a mere 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. When earlier he had coveted Mary's ointment worth 10 times as much. Even that though pales into insignificance before the price our Lord was about to pay on the cross for our sins, to take them away as the Passover Lamb of God. That would be a sacrifice wholly sufficient to blot out the sins of millions and reconcile them to God. And we thank him. We thank him for that terrible suffering, for by it we have our pardon. And it should pain us when, when we, in our sinfulness, lay ever more of that burden upon him with our sin. Yet we should also enjoy the freedom of forgiveness and rejoice in his dying, yet undying, love. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this wonderful salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we confess that we are still sinners to the effect that we still uh, shrink from the kind of costly obedience that was taught by your son when he walked the earth. Give us the grace, open our eyes to see the Lamb of God taking the punishment for all our sin, all our betrayal, that we might live so as not to grieve his spirit. We thank you that in him there is a merciful way back in repentance, no matter what our crime against him. And we pray that our lives in the power of the Spirit might grow to be more honouring, more glorifying to you. And for those yet unsaved, we ask that you might show them the same sacrificial love that you showed us, granting them that new birth that is the beginning of our walk with you. May we all rejoice in you together with that love that casts out fear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.